Good morning. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board comes to a conclusion on the cause of the crash landing of Asiana Airlines Flight 214. 64 years after the Korean War started, a story of a Korean War veteran who remembers the history and the people. The 4 billion won woman who created an empire from fruit. See how this family-owned business owns the industry. And you'll be surprised that a bed so hard has people so excited. The Mud Bed on Korea Today, Wednesday, June 25th, 2014. From Arirang News, this is Korea Today. And a good morning to you. Thank you for joining us on Korea Today. I'm Kim Young alongside Ojin Ji and Kim Min Jung. Good morning. This whole city government will receive recommendations on foreign candidates for honorary citizens until next month. And this year, they will expand the number of honorary citizens to 50 from the previous 20. That's right. right. And some of the people who have already won the title as the honorary Seoul citizens include football coach Gus Hiddink and mm -hmm. human rights activist Susan Schulte, as well as, of course, Jackie Chan, also known as Song Myung here in Korea. Right? I mean, do you think we can add Peter Bint or Mark Broom to the list? <laughs> Mark Broom, I was thinking of him. Highly right? recommend them. <laughs> if you have, if you do have names that you want to recommend, you have until the 31st of July to hand in your recommendations. So mm -hmm. go ahead and do that. All right, we'll begin our top story this morning. You may recall the crash landing of an Asiana airplane nearly a year ago in San Francisco that killed three people and injured nearly 200 others. While well, the U.S. safety investigators have now concluded that the pilots were at fault for having mismanaged the plane's descent and over-relying on automated systems. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board said as a result, the pilots flew the aircraft lower and slower than they had intended and slammed into the seawall at the end of the runway. The NTSB also added one of the pilots unintentionally deactivated an auto system that regulates airspeed and also delayed their decision to abort the landing and try again. Six people, including two passengers and four flight attendants, were ejected from the plane carrying more than 300 passengers from Seoul to San Francisco when the uh, plane broke apart in July 2013. Discussions on a range of issues, including Japan's recent report on the Kono Statement, took place between South Korea and the United States in Washington, D.C. Seoul's concern over the recent review by the conservative Shinzo Abe government of the landmark 1993 apology for Japan's forced sexual slavery during and before World War II was the main point of the talks during the high-level consultations with South Korean Vice Foreign Minister Cho Taeyong and U.S. Deputy Secretary of State William Burns. The two sides also discussed countermeasures to possible North Korean provocations, Seoul's wartime operational control and new rules on bilateral cooperation on civilian nuclear energy and development. On this Wednesday, the Vice Foreign Minister will also meet with Washington's envoy for the six-party talks, Glenn Davies, and other U.S. officials. The Defense Committee of the National Assembly is set to hold an emergency Q&A session on this Wednesday afternoon on the shooting spree by a Korean soldier that killed five and left seven wounded. National Security Advisor come Defense Minister Kim Guan Jin will be questioned on how the accident occurred and whether the military took appropriate measures in the aftermath. The sergeant responsible for the incident is in the intensive care unit after suffering a self-inflicted wound to the chest. Investigation is ongoing into what provoked the 22-year-old soldier three months ahead of his discharge to begin his rampage and the ensuing standoff with the military near the inter-Korean border town of Kosong. Exactly 64 years ago today, on June 25th, war broke out on the Korean Peninsula when North Korean troops invaded the South. Around 2 million soldiers from various countries were involved in the Korean War. This includes more than 600,000 South Korean soldiers. Now, nearly a third of these South Korean troops are still alive today to tell us their first-hand experiences. And Adyang Yu says Connie Lee met with one of these surviving veterans who says the war should never be forgotten. Let's connect live to Connie for more. Good morning, Connie. 
Good morning, Chinju. Well, I'm here at the War Memorial of Korea in Seoul, where those who fought and died in the war are remembered and honored. Now, for the 64th anniversary of the start of the Korean War, I met with one veteran who says uh, he desires two things today. One, for the war to never be forgotten, and two, to meet his American comrade while they're both still alive. Around this time every year, he can't help but think of his brothers. Although we fought in the war together, there are those still living today while others died young. It still breaks my heart. 87-year-old Lee chun Lak shows me the names of some of his veteran brothers engraved in the black marble walls at one memorial hall. They're the names of nearly 6,000 Korean War veterans who hail from the city of Ulsan in southern Korea. Lee's name is one of them. Rewind 64 years back. Lee was just a 23-year-old schoolteacher when he had a trade in his books for combat boots as he was drafted into the war. Because they were short on soldiers, if you were young, you were enlisted into the army. That was September 1950. At his home, evidence of his time in the war are on the walls, in photographs and in letters. One letter dates back to 1953, written by one of his closest compatriots in his platoon, a U.S. soldier who went by the name Smitty. There was an American soldier named Smith, Kenneth Smith. Besides the bathroom, we were practically together everywhere. Once the war ended and after a few letter exchanges here and there, they lost touch. But since then, Lee's been on the search for his American friend. How great would it be to see each other after all of these years? When I see him, I want to tell him that we're more than just brothers. We experienced life and death together and survived the war. I hope we can be good friends in our remaining years. Along with the memories of camaraderie are also the harrowing memories of war that not only left hundreds of thousands dead, but separated thousands of Korean families. Once that 38th parallel was drawn, the division creating North and South Korea lasted much longer than anyone ever imagined. I once saw a woman with a baby on her back come visit her soldier husband on a base in the South. The husband told his wife not to worry and to take care of the baby and told her they would be reunited in the North about three months later. Those three months turned into 30 and now 60-plus years, resulting in separated families of today. It's a sad reality. Lee says he hopes the realities of the Korean War, along with all the sacrifices that were made, will never be forgotten in the generations to come. The fact that our country exists today is from the sacrifices of the Korean War veterans who put their lives at risk to protect this nation. We cannot forget that. We also can't forget all the 16 nations that helped us fight our war. We can't forget their service that helped Korea to exist and prosper today. Now, there were a total um, of 16 UN nations that helped South Korea in the war with combat troops. Now, the nations are as listed here. You can see on this chart that most of the service members came from the U.S. with more than 1.7 million people. Even countries like Greece, New Zealand and Luxembourg contributed to the Korean War with combat troops. Now, there were also five other nations that helped South Korea with medical support and supplies. Now, those countries were India, Norway, Denmark. Mark, Sweden, and Italy. So Chinju in total, just for the Republic of Korea side, there were 21 UN nations involved. And you mentioned that Mr. Lee is looking for his fellow compatriot, a U.S. soldier named Kenneth Smith. I believe that he has been doing a lot to find him. What kinds of efforts were made to get in touch with him? 
Well, he actually sent a letter to the Korean embassy in the U.S. in the late 1990s uh, for help in getting in contact with his friend Kenneth Smith. Now, the embassy did write him back, and I do have a copy of the letter here. And in the letter, it says that uh, they were able to get in touch with the War Veterans Association in the U.S., but were not able to track him down. The letter also says that they will continue to find his whereabouts, um, including uh, making contacts in Washington. Now, from what Lee Chun-lak knows, he says that his friend lived in Connecticut, went to college there before entering the Korean War when he was just 20 years old. Jin Ju? Mm -hmm. We do hope they have some luck locating him. Thanks, Connie, for that coverage. That was our Connie Lee with a story from Korean War veteran. Good morning. It's time to run through the front pages of your newspapers. And yesterday, Prime Minister nominee Moon Chang-guk bowed out amid mounting criticism over past controversial remarks, striking yet another heavy blow to President Park Geun-hye and her reform drive pursued in the aftermath of the Seoul Lofer disaster. Now, this story on all of our papers this morning. We'll take a look at it on Chumang Ilbo first. There we go. Uh, the headline reads, Moon chang steps down, questioning Korea's democracy. Now, to sum up the article, uh, we'll take a look at the sub-headlines. Moon said that he initially wanted to help the president, but decided to withdraw his nomination because he did not want to be a burden to her. In an attempt to recover his tarnished reputation before withdrawing, though, he defended himself by saying that his remarks have been distorted and misinterpreted. Uh, he claimed that his basic rights, such as the freedom of religion and speech, were infringed upon and that he and his family could not just watch their honor being damaged through a political quarrel. Uh, he questioned Korea's democracy, saying that once the media avoids the truth, there is no more hope left in the country. He also criticized the National Assembly for ignoring the confirmation hearing law, which the members themselves created. Uh, shortly after this announcement, the president expressed regret over Moon's withdrawal. And in the meantime, another story on Moon uh, on Pyongyang Shin Moon. And this one actually is focusing more on the irresponsible government. The header reads, another nomination failure, no one taking responsibility. Uh, so the Daily holds a critical view on the latest withdrawal of Moon. Uh, the paper says state affairs aren't able to operate with these events repeatedly taking place. Uh, the, the president is likely to face another hard choice now to ward off criticism of her recurrent appointment failures and to find a new reliable figure tasked with restoring the battered image of the government. And leaving Moon chang there, we'll go to another domestic headline here to the side of Dong Ah um, we'll Take a look at this one here. Uh, the title says, a hero with no military number remains of KLO member to be placed in the National Cemetery. So for those of you who don't know or remember, this is about Choi Won-mo, who belonged to the Korea Liaison Office or the KLO unit during the Korean War. It's known as the KLO unit here in Korea. Uh, now, KLO was commanded by U.S. forces to collect intelligence on North Korea and its members had no military serial number thus. Uh, the armed North Koreans abducted Che back in 1967 while he was fishing in the West Sea with other crew members. Uh, the government has decided to enshrine the remains of Che in the National Cemetery for his services as an anti-North Korea espionage agent for the KLO. KLO. And in the sub-headline, uh, it says the government will hold an enshrinement ceremony on the 11th of next month at the uh, Seoul National Cemetery. The government also conferred a Medal of Merit to him last year. He is the first KLO member to be awarded this medal. And switching gears to the economy now over on the Mail Business newspaper. Take a look at this headline. And the headline reads, Dongbu Steel to be co-managed by Creditors Group. So Dongbu Group is under pressure by creditors to speed up its restructuring process. Now that the sale of Dongbu Steel's Incheon plant and Dongbu Power Tangjin Corporation, better known as the Dongbu Package, has fallen through. A Korea Development Bank, or the KDD, the main creditor of Dongbu Group, said yesterday that uh, the creditors decided to start supervising the restructuring process of Dongbu Steel, the group's flagship business based 
based on a voluntary agreement. Uh, KDB's decision came soon after POSCO, the nation's largest steelmaker, announced it had decided against buying the Dongbu package. And that was a look at your newspaper headlines for this Wednesday. Now coming up are the stock numbers from Tuesday. Now that the rain has moved out of the picture, we are expecting some very, very hot temperatures. That's right, that's right. I, I did it. I don't know which is worse, though. Well, I'd rather get the rain. It yeah. cools, right? <laughs> I, I, I've had to do it. I turned on the air conditioner for the first time this year. Wow, really? Yep, oh, yep. Mine it was, was pretty on warm. Way back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to look at uh, today's weather conditions around Korea and also here in the capital with Chun Song Cho, who joins us from Yongsan Gu, Yongsan District. Good morning to you, Song Cho. Good morning, guys. There will be various events throughout the day today to remember the Korean War 64 years ago. And just in time, the weather has finally calmed down after days of sporadic showers and thunderstorms all across the country. Mostly clear conditions are in store for us today. A high pressure system over the East Sea is giving out a fair skies nationwide, and the strong sun will bring the temperatures up as well as the levels of UV radiation. So if you're going to be outside for a long time, make sure to reapply sunscreen every couple of hours. In the afternoon, though, more clouds will build up, starting from the western regions, which can alleviate the heat a little bit. Most cities' midday highs will hover in the upper 20s today. And with that, let's take a closer look at today's temperature readings. You see, Daegu is even hitting the 30s at 31. The southern regions, such as Jeju and Busan, are slowly getting affected by the monsoonal front that's making its way back towards the peninsula, hence the lower highs than other regions. However, the, however, the front won't come all the way up, just affecting Jeju tomorrow with some precipitation. This is all for me with the weather update. Back to you, Min Jung. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following this Wednesday morning. Our Eunice Kim is standing by at the News Center. Good morning to you, Eunice. Good morning, Min Jung. Now, let's talk about the situation in Iraq. Now, Washington's push for a more inclusive coalition government in Iraq is now facing some opposition. That's right. As we touched upon yesterday, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is in Iraq trying to rally Sunni and Shiite leaders, as well as those from the Kurdish minority, to work together to prevent Islamist militants from tearing the country apart. Iraqi Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki has pledged to create a new parliament that includes all political and religious factions by the 1st of July. That's just around the corner, but others believe that the exact opposite may be the solution. Iraq Iraq's top Kurdish leader told visiting state secretary, again John Kerry Tuesday, that the Sunni insurgency has already created a new reality and a new Iraq, adding that Iraq was already falling apart. He also said publicly for the first time he plans to push for a referendum to break away from the Iraqi central government. Now, Kurds are a minority, but they do represent 20 percent of Iraq's population, and the Kurdish region is home to several several vast oil fields. Ukraine's military says pro-Russian rebels shot down one of its helicopters, killing all nine servicemen on board this on Tuesday. In response, the country's president, Pet Petro Poroshenko, warned he could cancel the week-long ceasefire in place, taking into account, quote, its constant violation by the rebels controlled from abroad. Rebel forces had agreed to observe the truce one day before. Meanwhile, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, expressed his hopes that the ceasefire would be extended beyond the upcoming Friday deadline to allow for 
plenty of time for substantive talks with the separatists from the mostly Russian-speaking East. Mm -hmm. Let's now head over to Japan, where Prime Minister Shinzo Abe hosted Philippines President Benigno Aquino on Tuesday. Now, he also received a vote of support for Tokyo's plans to expand its military role in the region. That's right. Of course, Japan and the Philippines share the similarity of being locked in territorial slash maritime disputes with China. Japan over the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands and the Philippines over territory in the South China Sea. Now, without naming China, a joint statement released after their meeting had Japan saying, Quote, both nations are closely coordinating in the face of the regional situation becoming increasingly severe. Meanwhile, Philippines President Benigno Aquino said he welcomes a change to Japan's constitution from its current pacifist form to uh, allowing more collective self-defense if it would allow Tokyo to come to the aid of allies in the event of an attack. He said Japan's ability to address its international obligations would, quote, bring us closer to the attainment of our shared goals of peace, stability, and mutual prosperity. And that's a wrap of the global headlines we're following this morning. And still to come, once upon a time there was a fruit deemed worthless, but now it's one of the most loved health foods in Korea. We're talking about Meshil and Strike Gold takes you to the place that got the plum craze started. Don't go away. Abstract portrayals of Korea, that's what the playwright uh, Ota Seok is very well known for. We've introduced his pieces before in the past, and our immunee joins us with his latest. Good morning. Good morning. So Ota Seok is uh, considered one of Korea's leading playwrights, and he's most known for his productions that deal with traditional themes in Korean culture, which perfectly describes his most recent production. Now, Moonlight of the River Pegma, that is a play that takes place uh, both in the present and in time when Korea was ruled by the Shila and the Pekcha dynasty. Take a look. Round and round, this shaman, dressed in a traditional robe, slowly spins his sword as he dances across the stage. Here, people can go back and forth, from this life to the afterlife, opening the doors to what could have been. And this shaman leads the way, holding the power to travel through time. Fast forward to the present. This grandmother's sick. And she's just had a vision of her granddaughter, Sundan, who's the reincarnated form of Kumhwa, an assassin sent to kill King Uija of the Pekche Kingdom. The king falls in love with her and lets her stab him. But his death results in a tragic tear between the two kingdoms. And it's up to Sundan to mend the rift. The girl goes back to the 1400s so that the Shilla and Begje kingdoms can exist together. It's been 64 years since the start of the Korean War, and the people of both Koreas should want to be together as well. That's what this play is about. 2014 marks the 30th year anniversary of the established Mokwa Repertory Company. Since their start in the 80s, the group has produced over 13 original plays. The company has seen dozens of awards for their unique performances that highlight the importance of communication and relationships within humanity. Moonlight of the River Pekma was first performed in 1993 and is being restaged to celebrate the group's success in the theater, a success that is attributed to the close working relationship between director Rowe and his actors, some of whom have made it to the big screen, but have decided to come back to where they started. It's been a while since I've been in the theater. The actors have so much more energy, and now that I've aged, I'm having a hard time following their power. The play is the basics of this industry, and that's why I've come back. The Mokwa group is giving me another chance to refresh and approach acting with the enthusiasm of a newcomer. 
It's a story that sings to the hearts of Koreans. A story about righting a wrong and learning to live in harmony. Mokwa has a reputation for their clever and original content that doesn't fail to entertain. And this performance is no exception. Some very familiar faces there. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, we did mention that it's not the first time you brought a work by Ota Sok. And remember the one you brought before? Right. So previously, I brought in his performance called Bicycle, another award winning performance um, that has to deal with, that deals with a town overcoming a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And he has a message. Ota Sok mm -hmm. definitely has a message that he wants to send. It seems that reunification is, is one of those messages that he wants to send. It's also influenced by the division of the two Koreas. Right. So Ota Sok is heavily influenced by the Korean War and the separation of the two Koreas. So he himself was actually a refugee of the war. And as a young boy, he saw many scenes of violence and of the devastation of a war. And so he wants to, with his work, send a message um, about the negative sides of a war and how you need to really overcome and come back together as a country, as a people. And so you can see that with this performance along with his other performances. All right. Thank you very much for bringing this report in, Uni. Always a pleasure. All right. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right, stay with us on Korea Today because still ahead, are you tired of that very soft mattress? Well, we have some rock hard options for you, and, but they're actually made of clay and they're very healthy for you. So there's nothing, nothing better than a good night's sleep. So what if you can boost circulation and slow aging while you snooze? Wait up for hot items. We have options for you. And time for news sum up. We all know that adequate sleep is vital for our health, but when stress levels are high or when something is on your mind, it can be hard to fall asleep. When you do a morning news, though, it's yeah. very easy. easy to <laughs> fall asleep. But apparently there are some foods that can help you get a good night's sleep, mm -hmm. and it's more than just warm milk. Yes, for more is. on this, our Ho Mi so joins us from the Digital Room. Good morning to you, Mi so -rang. Good morning, guys, and this humid weather isn't making it any easier. I'll introduce six sleep-inducing foods later on, but first, let's run through some of the other issues that are trending online. New apartments with more than 1,000 households must indicate potential interfloor noise levels on all their advertisements. Team Russia is at risk of being docked points by FIFA after their fans unfurled racist banners during Russia's match against Korea. Banners have the Celtic cross on it, a symbol associated with white supremacy and neo-Nazism. Actor Sojisop is back as a rapper with his single album titled 18 Years. An 8.0 magnitude earthquake in the U.S. state of Alaska and the 7.2 earthquake off the coast of New Zealand's chromatic islands is also trending. Now, going back to the first listing there, as early as the end of this month, new apartment complexes with more than 1,000 households must indicate potential interfloor noise levels on all their advertisements as a way to protect the consumer's right to know. Let's take a look. The Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport said yesterday that a bill regarding the matter has passed the Cabinet meeting. It's a revision of the existing regulations on standards of housing construction and stipulates that all advertisements must inform potential buyers on the housing's basic quality and performance. There are 50-odd categories in total that can be shown, 26 of which are mandatory, including factors that may exacerbate interfloor noise, such as the floor's ability to insulate impact sounds. Other categories include the apartment's adjustability for remodeling and the amount of sunlight expected. Once the bill obtains presidential sanction, it will be proclaimed as early as the end of this month. Moving on to our next issue, a list of six sleep-inducing foods that you should eat to get some quality shot eye is making the rounds online and grabbing people's attention. Let's see what made the list. Topping the list is bananas. They're well known for being rich in potassium, a muscle relaxant that will ease some of the tension in our bodies. Next on the list is tuna. Like bananas, they're packed with vitamin B6 and the essential amino acid tryptophan, ingredients that will boost the body's production of the sleep hormones melatonin and serotonin. 
There are foods that actually contain melatonin as well, such as tart cherries. A 2010 study published in the US Journal of Medicinal Food found that adults with chronic insomnia had their symptoms alleviated with two cups of tart cherry juices a day. Other foods on the list included hummus, which in tryptophan, lettuce that contains lactucarium, and pretzels for their magnesium and carbohydrate content. So remember these six foods the next time you have a bout of sleepless nights. And that concludes our look at today's edition of New Sum Up. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we continue on with our 2014 Brazil World Cup coverage. Now, four matches took place earlier today, including Italy and Uruguay, both trying to qualify for the next round. So let's take a look at the highlights. Of course, going into the match here, both nations neck and neck throughout the first half as both teams go into the second half tied 0-0. But the 59th minute, Claudio Marquisco with a red card leaves Italy with just 10 men. And then of a bit of a controversy as Luis Suarez goes biting his opponents again, where he apparently bit Giorgio Cellini on the shoulder, but no call. In the 81st minute, Diego Godin stores the lone goal, giving Uruguay the 1-0 win as Uruguay goes through the next round. Meanwhile, England and Costa Rica facing off. Offense for both sides nowhere to be seen as the 90 minutes come to an end with a 0-0 draw as Costa Rica finishes first in Group D. Meanwhile, over in Group C, Colombia and Japan squaring off with Colombia getting on board in the first half thanks to a penalty, but Japan will level it just before the end of the first half. But in the second half, Colombia strikes again thanks to Jackson Martinez in the 55th minute as they continue to score away as they crush Japan 4-1. And lastly, Greece taking on Ivory Coast. Greece takes a 1-0 first half lead thanks to Andreas Samaris in the 42nd minute. But in the 74th minute equalizer from Wilfred Boney makes it 1-1. But what do you know? Injury time, a penalty is called as Greece pulls away with a miraculous 2-1 victory as Greece advances to the next round. And now moving over to Group H, where according to several reports, Russia might face a disciplinary action by FIFA, leading to losing a point on their group standings. Now, over the weekend, when Germany faced off against Ghana, a Russian fan was seen holding an anti-Semitic flag. And while none of the FIFA officials intervened, there was Ghana Soli Montari, who made sure the fan was escorted out. Now, the Russian football team might face disciplinary action because of this incident. And if Russia does lose a point, it will leave them with zero points before their match against Algeria, giving Korea a better chance at advancing to the next round. Meanwhile, the investigation by FIFA will continue further. And now finishing things off and staying in Group H, Belgium, who's already got their ticket to the round of 16, plans to take it lightly against Korea in their final group stage match. Now, Mark Wolmich, the head coach of the Belgian national football team, stated that their players have been resting and relaxing after their win against Russia and have been just lightly practicing in their own time. Now, he added that he plans to rest at least two starters against Korea, hoping to avoid any unnecessary injuries before heading over to the knockout stages. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Now it's time to get a look at some of the small and mid-sized uh, businesses out there that are making big waves in the industry. And today we have sort of a fruity enterprise, but uh, this enterprise actually yields multi-millions of dollars worth of deals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joining that us is Jesse Day. Good morning. Good yes, morning, good morning. That is absolutely correct. And what we're talking about today is plums. But not just any plum, it's the Meishil or Korean plum. Mm. Most of those come from the Gwangyang region, but it wasn't always the, that way that it was so popular as a health food product in Korea, but it was one brand and one woman in particular who raised the status of the plum to that of a noble fruit. So let's check out her secrets to success. Gwangyang City, Jodamdo province, situated between Jirisan Mountain and the Somjingang River, is one of the best known plum farms in Korea, the Hongsangli Chong Meishil Farm. 
Wow, look at those. <laughs> so every year in June, Guangyang is full of the beautiful scent of plums. Plum production in Guangyang counts for nearly half of all production in the country. And as you can see here, they're storing the plums. They use a syrup to preserve them, actually. It does look tasty. Mm -hmm. And the Guangyang plum owes its popularity to one person, as I mentioned, and her hard work, which spans four decades. <laughs> <laughs> She's drinking gold water. <laughs> yes, this is Hong Sang Lee, the grandmaster of plums. In 1966, while working the field, I happened to try a plum which had fallen to the ground. That was the beginning. The farm started with a single plum tree planted by her father-in-law in 1917. After tasting one plum by chance, she recognized the fruit's benefits and potentials and for 40 years since, she's been growing and researching plums. Quite a dedication. Mm -hmm. Today the farm is 150,000 square meters wow. with some 10,000 plum trees. It's one of the nation's largest plum producers. Well, almost up to 500 tons right. harvested wow. each year. Wow. A lot, yeah. And uh, yeah, every June the farm produces around 500 tons and hundreds of plums grow on a single tree on average. It takes around three or four workers over half an hour to pick the fruits from just one tree. So a lot of manual labor, and they still do it by hand. And they have 10,000 trees. <laughs> and it has yeah. a lot of trees to get Take a lot of time. time. <laughs> wow. Harvested plums are immediately sorted and washed, and these steps too are all done by hand. The fruits come in various sizes and qualities, so each one has to be looked at closely. However, no matter how tiring, the farm believes farming should be done with that sort of honest sincerity. You know, I think it gives more credibility to the farmers because they haven't automated the whole entire process. Absolutely. And as you can see, they are packing the plums here. And they've always done things by hand. It's part of their tradition mm -hmm. and part of what makes them special. Another secret behind their success is hidden within some 3,000 crock jars found in one corner of the farm. Wow, that is a lot of changdotes. Uh, mm -hmm. I was the first to make food with plums. Pickles, gochujang, doenjang, extracts and everything else made with plums are all in these jars. Up until the 1990s, plums were considered inedible and weren't deemed fit to be put on the table. But in 1994, this farm became the first to create products using plums, such as doenjang and gochujang, it was also able to popularize plum extracts. Now there are plum gummies, candies, and even jams. Needless to say, Hang Sang Li Farm played a big role in establishing plums as the must-have summertime health food. You can see the variety of products they have there. Mm -hmm. From now on, the farm also plans to research and develop various plum food recipes that would entice the taste buds of younger generations. And if you add some uh, pork there, I'm sure that would help out quite a bit as they have in that setup. <laughs> the annual sales of the existing products already reach about 4 billion won. Concentrating on mail orders for customers from other areas added to their success. And now Hong Sang Lee Plum products are available not only in Korea, but in five other nations, including the US, China, mm. and Japan. So they are spreading worldwide. Wow. Australia as well, as you can see there. Hong Sang Lee is the founder of an immensely successful brand, yet her wants are simple. To be a farmer and share all the love that she's received to this day. I hope anyone suffering a heartache would come to our farm. I hope that they would throw away their pain in the mountains and into the Somjinggang River and instead fill their hearts with the beautiful scent of the plums. Mm. And we have
have some mesh joining us in the studio. Yes, right a variety of mesh products. Right. right, huh? And this is mesh tea, of course, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be good for the throat as well as other parts of your body, right? And mm -hmm. tastes very good that, as well. Right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't that. know yeah. so much <laughs> manual labor was involved in this cup yeah. of tea. I almost feel guilty about drinking <laughs> this. But um, is there a reason they're sticking to this method of doing it just manually like that? Yeah, a big part of it is tradition. Um, they're known as creating healthy products and that is part of the process for them. They believe that picking it by hand and doing a lot of the processes by hand is the most healthy way to go. So mm -hmm. it's a lot about tradition. It's also about having the healthiest product possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, I understand the uh, Kwangyang Mewha Festival is held each year, and that's the Plum, Plum Flower Festival. That's and right. Uh, this farm actually played a real big role in putting Kwangyang on the map for plum festivals. That's right. Uh, every March, when the Mewha or the plum flowers come into bloom, it covers Guangyang in the beautiful white flowers. So it's really a, a lovely sight to see. And the Guangyang Guangyang Festival is really, uh, or the Guangyang government has really gotten behind this Meihua Festival, which was originally initiated by Hong Sang Li, and they've made a lot of ways to, for it to be more accessible to visitors, including expanding the parking lots, even adding a bridge, and these efforts have led to attracting about 1.5 million visitors so far this year, so it's been a great success. And maybe the best thing about it, and another uh, thing that attracts people, is there's no the entry best part. fee. Yeah, <laughs> it's free. No entrance fee. <laughs> yeah, it's wow. free. And for a small fee, you can go ahead and pick some plums yourself and get that true Meishil experience. And it's all you can pick for that one low price. Yes, so that's right. So bring clothes with big pockets so you can stuff them in, right? And um, consumers these days are very health conscious. And farmers these days label their farm products right. even with their names mm -hmm. on it. So uh, Hong Sang Li Farm is a real, uh, real success story for this um, branding. That's right. Uh, people really trust and believe in the brand. Now, agricultural brands in general have been on quite a rise from 3,000 in 1999 up to 5,000 in just over a decade. And uh, Hong Sang Li Farm has really spearheaded that. And they've created a brand identity that consumers have grown to trust and believe in. And that has been a huge key to their success. Mm -hmm. As a consumer, you feel reassured when you see a name in right. your product. Do you see how you think uh, this person is responsible mm -hmm. for this type of food? Right? right, and when you look at Hong Sang Li, she's such a lovely yeah. lady, right. full of life and so kind and warm. Mm -hmm. So I think she's been able to associate that to the products that her company provides. Right. Her, her face just speaks honesty there. Right. You know, I would buy anything from her. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm just so sure. curious what that gochujang tastes like. I'm going to have to try some right. of that after. Gochujang. Yeah, there's what are jam. some of the goals that the farm has for itself? Well, the farm, in collaboration with the Guangyang government, is actually hoping to continue to develop new Meishil products and to be an innovator in that particular field. So uh, the farm and the government are working in collaboration. Now, Hong Sang Li Farm not only wants to develop products themselves, but they're planning on helping neighboring farms to do the same. So in the end, everybody wins, and of course, mm. they will be the leader in research and development. Right, for so she's definitely Meishil a person that's uh, doing the business, not just for herself, but the community as well. Yeah, absolutely. And she is an innovator mm -hmm. from that day when she was young and she tried that first plum that fell from the tree <laughs> to now where she's created a massive enterprise. Mm -hmm. She was the first in this particular field and you know, that's absolutely mm -hmm. a big part of the success as well. Mm -hmm. Something tells me this is sweeter than the regular gochujang. Right. It's it made might of be. Plum, yeah. so. We're going to have to take that downstairs with us for breakfast. It looks like jam. Look at this. It's a pill made out of meishi extract. Okay. Mm -hmm. So hmm. it's good for your health. Take, take you know, it one, so I once think a I need day. That. I need my vitamins <laughs> for today. <laughs> All, All right. right. All right, sounds great, Jesse. Thank you for joining us and uh, bringing us this report about this very successful and uh, actually contributing to the uh, community, uh, this business here. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. For hot items, we would much rather be over there than over here. We mm -hmm. have some beds, mm -hmm. in fact, two beds, comfortable looking beds over there. <laughs> right, and Angela Park and Peter Bent joins us to introduce those products. 
Good morning. Good morning to you guys. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Or should I say good night? Maybe we're going to go to sleep now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, Angie, did you sleep well last night? Because sleep is such an important part of our lives, right? It is indeed. And to be honest, I actually got more sleep than usual, so I'm feeling pretty good. Wow. But um, if you do the math, essentially we're spending a third of our lives pretty much no sleeping. Wow. So if you, you figure a third of your lives, you want to make sure it's a quality area that you're spending that time. In. Yeah, you want to invest in that, absolutely. And these days, the interest in well-being and the importance of a good night's sleep is really peaking. And that's why we're going to look at some mud mat beds today on hot items. Yes, that's Ooh. a kind of a foreign concept maybe for some of our mm -hmm. viewers. Um, uh, we're talking about a particular product made by Hook, which in Korean means uh, like clay or mud, yeah. right? And uh, in for overseas people, it's known as the mud mat. So this company actually, it's uh, pretty much first kind of coined or came up with this concept of a mud mat type of bed in 1992, mm. won a bunch of awards, international domestic patents for this, and it's um, probably one of the leading companies in this particular field for special function beds. Wow, that mm -hmm. sounds amazing. So let's take a closer look, I guess. Okay. So, um, um, the concept of ondor, especially anyone who's kind of familiar with winters in Korea should know, but um, basically it takes the concept of heating um, from the floor up through red clay, and so we're mixing this tradition with modern technology. Okay, so this is the bed. If mm -hmm. I take, yes, a, yes, yes. take a little... Okay. <laughs> This is not your average cushy mattress. Uh, it's very be hard. It's, it's mud pretty bed. much hard as rock. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So why did they decide to make a hard bed out of mud? Well, that's exactly how great this mud is for you. So um, actually, to give you a little bit of a history lesson, not only is this particular mud, it emits far infrared rays, but that's mm -hmm. essential for animal plant growth. But if you look at some of the women that used to work with some of the furnaces made of this red clay, and of course, obviously, there's heat coming out of the furnace, they were a lot healthier than women who didn't. We're talking about health benefits like fighting chronic fatigue. It's good for your cellular tissue. It fights aging, which is wow. always something that people start to listen to, right? And um, it's it's just overall so many health benefits that are um, that are essential for just living a healthy life. Okay, but it doesn't look like it's made of mud, right? You're not going to get dirty lying <laughs> right, on right, that. Right, right, right. So how is it actually made, the mud mat underneath this? Okay, so let me show you the key point, the secret lies. <gasps> all in here wow. made of this particular dust, I guess I can call it because it's not uh, mud yet, right? So this is clay or mud dust, right? Right, so this is the base. So we use just high quality red clay. They take the top quality red clay and then what they do is they mix it, ferment it and press it three times and that's to prevent any crocks, or cracks, I'm sorry in the bed, right? So after that, they are going to frame it and uh, top it off with a resin type of a layer. And like you mentioned, Peter, that's to ensure that you're not technically sleeping on the mud, right? Sure, you don't want to get dirty. But I'm sure many of our uh, our viewers out there, they're going to be curious about the makeup of the mud mat itself. What, what are the layers that are involved there? Right. In fact, I'm going to I'm gonna actually kind of take a seat here as okay. well now Looks that we talked about it. because. It's all heated up actually for us. Yours is heated up as well, Ooh, so you can take a seat. Okay. But um, for our viewers who are curious about the makeup, there are 13 layers, right? And so um, wow. we're talking about there's a copper board, a copper board, I'm sorry, on the bottom, and then there are eight different layers for the heating system. And then on top of that, we have the framed mud, like we mentioned, and then the resin on top. And then the frame overall of the bed is made out of quality mahogany, natural ca uh, cowhide, and we have latex cushions as well. And a lot of people are familiar with the benefits of that. Sure, it looks fantastic, but you, you mentioned that you need to heat it up, right, Angie? Yes, and so I assume right you use electricity <laughs> to do that. So what about the electromagnetic Waves. You know, we've heard Ooh, a lot of bad things about that. Peter, those. you're always asking the tough Sorry. questions, <laughs> right? Well, I did my homework. And so how it works is they're using special alloy heat coils, and then they have like a three-layered sheath, one made of silicone, and then there's two made of Teflon. And what that all means, basically, in short, is that it helps to fight electromagnetic waves. In fact, it passed Korea certification tests for electromagnetic-related uh, products. And the key is it um, actually passed some safety standards by 
pizza by Sweden. And if you guys are familiar, those are some of the toughest safety standards to meet in the world. So, Absolutely. you know, there okay. you go. All right, so that's all sorted with the bed. But it's not just beds. What I'm sitting on now, it's got this uh, odd little frame. It's a yes. flat bench. So they've also made some, uh, some couches and benches using this mud mat, which is fantastic. And you may be a little bit concerned about the energy costs if you've got the uh, flat bench and the bed in your uh, in your bedroom, mm -hmm. but the electricity costs are really low because it's very energy efficient. Like if you had to heat up a whole block of mud, it would take maybe a long time, but the heating board and the mud board have been built together. If you leave this on, all day long for a month, it'll only cost 11,000 won to run. Oh, so very efficient, Really right? efficient, and it's got mm -hmm. another super function. What you can do is uh, you can put some solid oxygen into a, uh, a little uh, a compartment up here, and you can uh, breathe in some pure oxygen. It's brilliant. That's kind of a foreign concept to me because we have oxygen all around us, but <laughs> a solid oxygen, how yeah. is, does that exactly work? So we've got a little sample right, here right. That, that, that you put in. You just place this block into the bed, the head of the bed. So mm -hmm. while you're sleeping, you get some uh, pure oxygen that you breathe in, the CO2 goes out, it clears your head and everything like that. Um, and it's just great. This block mm -hmm. is the equivalent of a four meter tall tree in your house. Four meters yeah. and it's not, in not your quite home. 20 centimeters. Okay. <laughs> So especially us being trapped in the urban jungles, right? Concrete jungle, whatever you like to call mm -hmm. it. Um, it's giving us some of the health benefits, I guess we can find in a forest. Sure, maybe? like if you were right. outside. Um, but what's great is you only have to change it every three to four months. Um, so you get that benefit as well as the heat from the bed. It's an all round health package, right? Uh, let's be honest though. I mean, right now it's so hot that people are kind of thinking <laughs> heated beds. Why do you need that, right? So that obviously is targeting more of the winter season, mm -hmm. but in the summer, you just turn off the heating function and you, you can spend some nice, uh, cool summer nights just on like a mud frame. And so you get the, you get the, kind of the cooling function yeah. as well. Yeah, before the show, we turned these off and they were really cool. Like mm -hmm. people use cool mats these days, right, but with right. this, you won't need that at all. The mattress itself, the mud mat is very cool if you turn off the power. Right, so um, a lot of people who aren't really familiar with the harder surface beds, <laughs> maybe kind of thinking, I don't understand, wouldn't you want something more soft and cushiony? But um, there are a lot of different factors to think about and I'm sure our MCs are kind of familiar, especially in Korea, a lot of people do prefer the harder surfaces, Sleeping right? on the floor, right? Yeah. Supposedly better for your yeah, back. Better for your yeah, back. yeah, mm. exactly. Are we getting old now? Because I am starting <laughs> to prefer the more support. <laughs> well, you, just, you got your next bed right there. I know, right? There so, if you're <laughs> willing you to guys. buy it for us. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, wow. thank you very much for that. From uh, mud festivals to mud baths and mud right. mats, we have right. it all, right? Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. That's just about does it for this edition of Korea Today. All right. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday morning. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.